Hello, chemistry students. We are starting chapter 13, section 4, looking at colligative properties. We'll look at Raoult's law, calculate the effect on boiling point and freezing point of a solvent caused by a solute, calculate osmotic pressure for solutions, use colligative properties to determine the molar mass of a solute, and use the Van't Hoff factor in colligative property calculations involving ionic solutes. Colligative properties are the physical changes that result from adding solute to a solvent. Colligative properties depend on how many solute particles are present as well as the solvent amount, but they do not depend on the type of solute particles, although they do depend on the type of solvent. Some colligative properties that we are going to investigate further, looking at freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, osmotic pressure, and vapor pressure lowering. First, we're going to look at vapor pressure lowering using Raoult's law. I'm going to show you a quick video to kick off this part. In this video, I want to talk about Raoult's law. But in order to understand Raoult's law, you first have to understand vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is a pressure that is present at the surface of a liquid. And you can see right here, I've drawn a beaker full of a liquid. And the surface of the liquid is represented by this black wavy line up here. These red dots are supposed to represent individual molecules that make up the liquid. And you can sort of see what's happening at the surface here. Some of the red dots are leaving the liquid and coming out here, while others are coming out from here back into the liquid. So every time a red dot leaves, that represents a molecule of this liquid evaporating. And now it's a vapor molecule out here. And every time one of the vapor molecules returns to the liquid, that is condensation. This is happening many, many times per second at the surface of this liquid. And you can imagine all of this bouncing around of molecules up here as vapor is going to create a pressure. And we call that the vapor pressure. So what Raoult's law says is that if you add in a non-volatile solute, that's what these green dots are, and a non-volatile solute is simply something that we dissolve into this solution that can't evaporate at the surface like the red dots can, then you lower the vapor pressure. And the reason for this is that we've essentially crowded out the surface of the solution and the red dots now have a harder time evaporating and creating this vapor pressure that we saw before. So whenever you dissolve a non-volatile solute into a pure solvent, you lower the vapor pressure. That's Raoult's law. So Raoult's law mathematically says that the vapor pressure of the solution, P solution, is equal to X solvent, or the mole fraction of the solvent, times P solvent, or the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. So let's think about this mathematically with a couple examples. So down here, I have an example where we're calculating P solution, or the vapor pressure of a solution. And you can see our X solvent here was 1. That means the mole fraction of the solvent is 1. That's a situation like this where our solution is entirely made up by a pure solvent. In other words, our solution is a pure solvent. So they're really the same thing. So we would expect to have the same vapor pressure for our solution as we did for our pure solvent. And that's the case. 1 times 50 bar is 50 bar. So the solution and the solvent have the same vapor pressure. But what if the mole fraction of the solvent is not 1? Well, if we decrease it down to 0.5, we may have a situation that looks something like this, where now these red dots, the pure solvent, only represents half of the molecules in the solution. The mole fraction went down to 0.5. And now this non-volatile green solute makes up the other 0.5 of the mole fraction. Well, in this case, when we decrease the mole fraction by half, guess what happens to the vapor pressure of the overall solution? It decreases proportionally by one half. Now when we multiply 0.5 by 50, we go down to 25 bar. So when you decrease the mole fraction of the solvent, the vapor pressure of the solution decreases proportionally as well. So let's do an example problem. 80 grams of sucrose, and I've got the molecular formula of sucrose right here, were dissolved in 100 milliliters of water. What is the expected vapor pressure of the solution at 25 degrees Celsius? So this is clearly a Raoult's law problem because we're dissolving a solute into a solvent, water, and we're asked about 
TurboTax Live full service takes taxes off your plate without putting more work on your shoulders. A local tax expert will do your taxes start to finish, online or in person, where available. Imagine having your taxes done and off your mind the same day you start. No waiting or wondering. You can choose to stay with the same expert next year or get matched with someone new as your life changes. It's up to you. Fast, friendly, and 100% accurate. That's TurboTax Live full service. Leave your taxes to us. Uh, vapor pressure. So in order to solve this problem, we're going to have to use Routes Law's equation. And that says that the vapor pressure of this overall solution, which is what they asked for, is going to be equal to the mole fraction of the solvent. And in this case, water is our solvent, sucrose is our solute. And then we're going to multiply that by the vapor pressure of the pure solvent or pure water. So in order to solve this problem, we need these two things right here. The mole fraction of the solvent and the vapor pressure of the pure solvent so that we can solve for the vapor pressure of the overall solution. So the vapor pressure of pure water at 25 degrees Celsius is something that you can look up on a table and you should find that it's 0.0317 bar. So this is what our vapor pressure of the pure solvent is at this temperature. So really all we need now is the mole fraction of the solvent. And really the mole fraction of the solvent is the mole fraction of water. And this is gonna be defined as the moles of water over the total moles of the solution. In other words, moles of water over moles of water plus moles of sucrose. So first I found moles of water, and to do this I needed the density of water, which is one gram per milliliter. So since we had 100 milliliters, we know that we have 100 grams of water. Then I simply converted 100 grams of water to moles of water by dividing by water's molecular weight, and I got 5.56 moles of water. So then I went ahead and did the same thing for moles of sucrose. I found we had 80 grams of sucrose to begin with, divided that by sucrose's molecular weight, and I saw that we had 0.234 moles of sucrose. So now I was ready to compute my mole fraction for water, which again is moles of water, 5.56, over total moles, 5.56 plus 0.234, and then I multiplied that by the vapor pressure of our pure solvent, which I knew was 0.0317, and I got my final answer of 0.0304 bar. So let's think about what happened here. Our mole fraction of water was 0.96 roughly. That means that approximately 0.96 or 96% of this solution was made up by moles of water. So we would expect that if a solution made up of 100% moles of water had a vapor pressure of 0.0317 bar, then a solution made up of about 96% moles of water would have a total vapor pressure of about 96% of 0.0317, which is about what 0.0304 bar is. So building off of that, like you just said, when a non-volatile solute dissolves in a liquid, the vapor pressure of the solvent is lowered. Experiments show that the vapor pressure of the solvent over the solution, which is our P solvent, is proportional to the mole fraction of the solvent. We can write out our expression called Ryle's Law that expresses this relationship right here, where P solvent is the vapor pressure of the solvent over the solution, P naught is the vapor pressure of the pure solvent, and this X is the mole fraction. An ideal solution is defined as one that obeys Ryle's Law precisely. However, just as no gas is truly ideal, no solution is truly ideal. But this is a good approximation of solution behavior in most instances, especially at low solute concentrations. We can also modify Ralph's Law to give another useful equation that allows us to calculate the lowering of the vapor pressure of the solvent as a function of the mole fraction of the solute. So when we substitute Ralph's Law for P solvent, we get this pretty equation, so keep that on the back burner. So the decrease in the vapor pressure of the solvent is proportional to the mole fraction relative to the number of particles of the solute. Let's do a sample problem. You dissolve 651 grams of ethylene glycol in 1.5 kilograms of water. So we know our solute is what we are dissolving into our water, 1.50 kilograms of water. What is the vapor pressure of the water over the solution at 90 degrees Celsius? The vapor pressure of pure water at 90 degrees is 525.8 millimeters of mercury, which is found in Appendix G. First, I wanted to find the amounts of each of these and find my mole fraction. So I took my water and I went grams of water to moles of water. I took my 651 
grams of ethylene glycol. I went grams to moles, so I know moles of both. My X, my mole fraction for water, I took my moles of water divided by total moles to get 0.8881. So to apply Ryold's law, I just need to take that X of water, times it by that 525.8 millimeters of mercury, which is the vapor pressure of water, to get 467 millimeters of mercury. Here we have another question asking us to find the vapor pressure of water over this solution. Again, we're given a solute, 10 grams of sugar. We're given the amount of solvent, the amount of water, 225 milliliters, which is 225 grams. And we have water at 60 degrees Celsius. So we need to look in Appendix G to find out what that partial pressure of water at that temperature is. To find my mole fraction, I had to go grams to moles for both to find my mole fraction of water. Since we're finding the vapor pressure of water, I had to find my moles of water over total moles to get 0.9977. And in the index, my partial pressure of water is 149.4 millimeters of mercury. So I got 149 millimeters of mercury. See if you can solve this one, pause the video. Check your answer. This graph just kind of shows us our y-axis is our vapor pressure and this is with temperature. We can see what happens to the vapor pressure of pure benzene. We can see what happens to the vapor pressure when I have benzene plus a solute. And we can see that there is a difference. It has been lowered, the vapor pressure lowers when we add that solute. Another colligative property that we will investigate is how the boiling point of a solution varies with solute concentration. In fact, a simple relationship exists. The boiling point elevation, shown by delta T BP, is directly proportional to the molality of the solute. In this equation, K BP is a proportionality constant called the molal boiling point elevation constant, and it has units of degrees Celsius per molal. There are values of KBP that have been determined experimentally, so they are in a table that's in your book, and we will just need to refer to that when we're doing problems. Here's just a few that I wrote down for water and carbon tetrachloride that are just very common ones to use. Let's look at an example problem. We have a compound that's found in nutmegs and cloves, has a formula of C10H12O2. What is the boiling point of a solution that contains 0.144 grams of this compound dissolved in 10 grams of benzene? First, since we need to find the molality, which is in moles per kilogram, we need moles of this compound. So I'm going to take my 0.144 grams and find the molar mass of it and go from grams to moles, giving me my moles. And if I have 10 grams of benzene, that is equal to 0.01 kilograms. So I find my molality, and then to plug it into my boiling point elevation, my delta T BP, this is my constant for benzene. You would find this in table 13.3 in our current textbook. Times that by the molality, and we would get the boiling point elevation. Now we need to look up the normal boiling point for benzene without any solute in it is 80.1 degrees Celsius. Now we add the elevated boiling point, the 0.222, to give us the new boiling point for this solution. Here it's asking us what quantity of ethylene glycol must be added to 125 grams of water to raise the boiling point by one degree Celsius. So if I use my equation, delta T BP is equal to the constant times the molality, I looked up the K, the constant of water, 0.5121, and I want my boiling point elevation to be elevated by one degree Celsius. So I need to find my M, my molality, that's my unknown. So I'm going to divide both sides by 0.5121. That tells me that my molality is 1.95. Remember, molality is moles per kilogram. Well, I'm going to then multiply by 0.125 kilograms of water, because that's 125 grams of water. That will leave me with my answer in moles of glycol. That's what this is. And if I know moles of glycol, I can get to grams of glycol by finding the molar mass, giving me 15 grams of glycol. So if I put 15 grams of glycol into 125 grams of water, it would raise that boiling point by one degree Celsius.
What's the relevance? Why do we care about boiling point elevation? The elevation of the boiling point of a solvent on adding a solute has many practical consequences. One of them is the protection your car's engine receives in summer using all season antifreeze. The main ingredient in commercial antifreeze is ethylene glycol. The car's radiator and the cooling system are sealed to keep the coolant under pressure, ensuring that it will not vaporize at normal engine temperatures. When the air temperature is high in the summer, however, the radiator could boil over if it was not protected with antifreeze. By adding this non-volatile liquid, the solution in the radiator has a higher boiling point than that of just pure water.